start, Karen, with you. Karen Roder Davis is um, an entrepreneur. She has uh, worked in, in large organizations like Google and also uh, been a founder and creator of some startups, but works on a number of boards of different sizes. How is, has um, creating at the board level um, kind of that, that both vis visual and quiet diversity impacted the companies you've worked with, um, both large and small? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'll answer that by a little bit of a fun fact, I guess. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there was this study that um, came out recently about 750 strategy consultants uh, using AI. And it turned out that um, while the content produced was potentially better, uh, that they lost, relying on GPT-4 outputs, reduced the group's diversity of thought by 41%. And the propensity for errors actually increased even on rote tasks because they were relying completely on the convention. And when I think about the importance of diversity on boards, uh, that same uh, characteristic holds that uh, there's a lot of things that can be automated, but when you're doing things by rote and you're not introducing different personalities, different perspectives, different uh, functions, um, different experiences, that you, you really run the risks of massive blind spots. Uh, and that can be, um, you know, as from a small company all the way through to the largest ones. Uh, so having spent a lot of my career in cross-pollination and in innovation uh, in companies large and small, you know, having a lot of different voices in the room, uh, as painful as it can be sometimes and as slow as it can be sometimes, is ultimately uh, the way to, uh, that, that things happen. Great. That's great. And I love that sort of relying, the, relying on convention. Um, Miller Adams, I have to think that uh, particularly in organizations like Boeing and places where you've worked, where, uh, you know, as someone who puts myself in one of those aluminum tubes uh, regularly, I want there to be convention. I want there to be consistency and, and uh, a very clear uh, way that things are done that, that are, allows for, uh, obviously, the safety of the airline industry. But um so how, when in, an, in a highly regulated in, industry or in regulated both, I think, externally and internally, how does diversity come in play, into play in, in the organizations you've uh, been a part of? That's a very good question, uh, Chris. Uh, thanks you for raising that. I would say that diversity becomes uh, more of a quiet exercise than a loud exercise, which is why the title of this panel was particularly interesting to me. Uh, from my experience, both at Boeing and, and after retiring now on various public boards, just walking in the room becomes a matter of quiet diversity for me. And I think that's pretty clear. Uh, it's certainly at the public board sector, that, that would be the case. Uh, there isn't a lot of shouting and table pounding. It's really just being there, the presence in the room. And so in those regulated areas, which tend to be sort of old school, if you will, uh, I think it's important for one to really embrace the notion that it's going to have to change to keep up with what is going on in the larger society and how is that going to operate and how is that going to be functional, functionally you know, efficient, if you will. Uh, Boeing was a very interesting experience from, for me personally for, from the perspective of diversity because there were very few black senior executives at the company. Um, and I was always concerned about that. Uh, but that just started to change over time. And that will continue to change, even though I'm no longer active in the company. I know it is continuing to change. I see the same thing at Accenture Federal Services, which is the U.S. arm of Accenture PLC, you know, the large global consultancy and, and technology company. Uh, very big company, 700,000 plus employees. Diversity is, is a key thing there. And from the board perspective, you know, the quiet diversity is another thing that I notice. You have to be able to really function in that sort of environment as a board member. Certainly at Accenture Federal Services, the largest provider of professional services to the U.S. government, all agencies, uh, uh, civilian and, and, uh, and defense, uh, it's important for us to really walk the talk about diversity. So I think the quiet diversity uh, title of this, uh, this panel, again, was very intriguing to me, which is why I was very pleased to, to participate look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Miller, thank you. Arthur, I'm going to turn to you. Um, as, a, as an investor, you... Um, I get work with many of these companies in some of their earliest days as they begin to, to put together their strategies for building their board and building their teams. 
Um, how have you um, helped to infuse a culture of, of embracing diversity, inclusion, belonging into the, some of the early, at the earliest stages of the companies that you're building? Chris, thanks for the question. I think the, the, the real kind of um, part of it is as a board or as an advisor, you want to make the best decisions possible and provide the best advice possible. And you have to do that with the diversity of thought and perspectives, because again, you're going to have a diverse uh, employee base, diverse customer base, be able to incorporate all those perspectives is going to help you lead to the best decision possible. In fact, one of my VC buddies, we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago, and they ran an interesting study at his firm. And whenever they, they, they had to vote on making an investment, they had the, all the GPs gathered for the meeting, and they had three outcomes. One was pretty much a unanimous yes to those investments, and they tracked the performance. One was a majority yes, where there was a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, but it just kind of was a majority yes, not a unanimous yes. And one was a, uh, a no. Okay. And they checked the, and I thought that the performance of, all, of the three outcomes, I thought the best performing one would be the unanimous yes, but it turned out to be the majority yes, because they had a really diverse conversation, diversity of thought. And that would turn out to be the best performing set of investments that they had because they had the diversity of thought around the tables. That's why I think it's important to have uh, that collective, diverse perspective. And I'm, we're going to come back to that that conversation because I think that's a really important. How, how do we create the diverse perspective conversation? But before we do that, I want to uh, introduce Mercedes DeLuca, who um, brings a, a tremendous, uh, a lot of technical experience to this conversation. I think currently serving as a the CIO for Pebble Beach Resorts. Um, and I want to also point because I know you have, I believe you have some some nonprofit board experiences as well. And, and, and I think one, one of the, to just for our audience, I think to note is that what you're looking here with this wonderful panel are people who have great experience with large corporate boards, um, smaller startup boards, nonprofit boards, for-profit boards, public boards. This is a diverse uh, perspective on those kinds of uh, governing bodies. And, and I think that I'm beginning to hear that there's consensus about the real import of using that role in your organization to, um, to really affect change around the issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging. But um, that's a, a roundabout way of getting back to Mercedes. I want to hear, Mercedes, what you're experiencing, and certainly if you can maybe weave in a little bit of that perspective from your, your nonprofit board work as well. Yeah, I'll start there because that is really personal for me. I serve on the Pebble Beach Company Foundation, which is really focused on youth education in Monterey. And the Monterey area is, has a lot of Hispanic and Latino community. One of the quiet diversity about me that you don't see is that I was raised in a Cuban household. Um, and so for me, my perspectives, my education changed my life. My ability to go to engineering school changed my life. So fast forward to my public board service, um, one of the other quiet diversity pieces there, clearly gender was not so quiet, but one of them was being a first time board member. And that to me is a very interesting perspective unto itself. You know, it's very hard for people to get on public boards if they've never served on boards before. And yet when you join a board and you're new, um, it does give you the opportunity to ask a lot of what I used to call dumb questions, but You'd be surprised how many times those questions sparked really good um, discussions. And so, you know, from my perspective, quiet diversity is really about different socioeconomic backgrounds. The company I serve on the board is a fulfillment company. We have very varied um, employees. The same is true for Pebble, where we have, you know, a large workforce of hourly employees with different perspectives. And... Um, different union rule, all the things that come to play. So to me, um, it, it is about that diverse thought. It's also about what you, that perspective you bring to the table. And I liked what Arthur said about um, having disagreement. We have a lot of disagreement on our board, but the things that, that stand out for me is it's respectful and people listen. Everyone gets an opportunity to be heard. Our, our chairperson does a great job of facilitating. And I think one of the things that helps diversity grow of thought and of gender and of 
ethnicity and anything else is the ability to express yourself and be heard. If I could piggyback for a second on that, Chris, I think that one important thing that Mercedes said is that there's many dimensions to diversity, not just race and gender, but there could be a first time board member, a non-engineer. And so I think it's important to understand what are some of the dimensions that you bring to the table that could be considered diverse as a, and looking past just race and gender. Absolutely. And that's, in fact, I think why we're here today to talk about those kinds of things. And, I, and, and there's so many ways we can take this conversation, but I want to dive right into that one, that question. Point, Arthur, because because the things that make a board really dynamic and really, I think, effective are often these invisible um, points of view. And I think we are also in in professional settings um, often advised or trained against getting too personal in in interviews and things of this sort. And and we see a lot of boards and, and frankly, executive teams that grow up out of well, this is somebody I worked with before. We went to college together. We've known each other a long time. We tend to to um, bring our tribe together when we when we're uh, moving around through our careers. Um, what are some of the techniques? And I'll just throw this to to anyone who wants to jump in on this that you you found effective in kind of breaking out of that um, tribalism, if you will, to find uh, find those diverse those diverse perspectives, diverse experiences that really are value add, but are often hard to see. I, I have a funny story, if I can share it. This is, this is, uh, this is by accident, right? So I was going to a very, I was working for Goldman Sachs at the time. I was going to a very important uh, board meeting and I had to present a portion of the deck and to get myself really kind of uh, revved up and riled up for that. I always kind of listen to really loud rap music, right? And so we had the meeting, it was a great presentation. One of the senior MDs asked to ride home with me to get a ride home to the, to the office. I said, no, sir, no problem. Went in my car, forgot to turn down the rap music. So I started my car, the music came blaring up. I was so embarrassed, but the MD said, turn that back on, it's one of my favorite songs. And so it surprised me that we had a connection with this, this kind of niche rap music, but that kind of led to a great connection and talking about our ability to kind of bond and find that diversity within that small uh, being authentic in that way. So it's kind of a funny story, but it just, it just t- taught you, Hey, listen, it's okay to be authentic to kind of uncover some of those diverse perspectives from you, from your colleagues you would never expect. Right. So rap music, that's great. That's one. Um, what other I think it's a missed. I think it's a missed opportunity. You know, as I moved with my career, you know, you're moving almost every few years in high tech, right? And there is that temptation to take the tribe with you, whether it's on a board or with you to the new company. But one thing I, I try to like intellectualize, talk to myself. And one of the things I tried to tell myself, in part because the labor market was tight and nobody wanted to leave um, their various roles, is that when you come in, if you don't immediately bring your tribe over, you have an opportunity to cultivate and meet an entire new set of people and make a whole new set of connections. And those could end up being the more deep lasting relationships as well. Not to mention that it's a great opportunity for people who have worked in your organization to ascend after you leave your other organizations and so that they can become leaders. So to me, I always try to see that positive side of taking the harder trek uphill versus just importing all of the same team, successful team that I had at another company or board. Yeah, finding the real benefit of that, right? It's, it's hard work, right? You're starting yeah. over, um, but the, the reward on the other side of that is, is so much bigger. That's a really strong point. Uh, Chris, but from if I can make a comment on that, from from my experience again with the public company boards, particularly where the nomination and governance committee becomes a very important component of the overall organization, uh, I I think it's always important to try to get on that committee uh, because that committee is really charged with um, addressing the issue of uh, bringing new board members uh, on, and that's where it's important to start asking the right questions. Uh, again, typically with a big public board, they're going to be using a search firm, of course, and uh, just looking at the makeup of the team, the search for firms send over for interviews should tell one a little bit about how that firm is going to operate in, ter- in terms of surfacing candidates. And then just, just the, the quiet diversity part of that is asking a lot of questions. You know, what, what sort of pool do you anticipate bringing back to us? And when the pool shows up, 
if it doesn't sort of meet with your expectations, you need to say this isn't exactly what I thought we were going to see. Let's talk about the pool that you are developing for this particular search. And, uh, and I think that there isn't a lot of drama there. It's just sort of making it clear that you expect this search firm uh, to sort of mirror uh, the direction that the board wants to go in terms of, of uh, the, new, the new board members who are being surfaced. And so of all the different committees on a public company board, that's the one I always try to get on uh, because then I can really influence the way that board develops over time in a quiet way, <laughs> which again sort of speaks to the, to the title of our panel. There's no need for yelling and screaming. Just ask some you know, sort of straightforward questions about how is this process going to operate? And if it gets to the point that your people are saying, we don't know where to go to get candidates, they're being very honest. And then I think, sorry, waving at a dog going by here, speaking of dogs, uh, I think that would be a, a way that we could influence as board members how that board develops over time. I think to add to that, it really requires a self-awareness on behalf of each individual as well as on behalf of the board. Because, uh, you know, as with companies, the board has its culture and the way it operates and the way it uh, manages conflict, the way it manages discussion, uh, sometimes quiet and in some cases, you know, it should be some, but in other cases uh, where uh, culturally there's a lot of discussion and a much more emotion, uh, you will get some variation in that. And so uh, really understanding what that, how you can describe that to as part of not your nom gov committee uh, or your board in general uh, to folks who are helping you with that search is really important to uh, to cull uh, the list of candidates again in, in the most effective way across all all potential uh, qualities. Well, you know, I think it's it's interesting. You kind of all have in different ways touched on this this issue. I would say that the the corporate culture kind of trickles down from the board, right? So if the board is embracing a certain uh, set of values and, and, and where diversity among others is part of them, um, that kind of trickles down. For that, that those diverse perspectives, and, and Arthur, you were kind of alluding to this, Mercedes, you all have been in one way or another, requires the ability to engage with one another in a way that's, that's respectful and open, that is, is vulnerable to um, being uh, being heard and to listening, and uh, in, in a phrase that um, Amy Edmondson has coined years ago, it's creating an environment of psychological safety. Is this a place where it's it's safe for me to have um, a divergent perspective that might um, challenge the perspectives of other members of the board? And how do we um, how do we respect each other and, and to do that without you know, I, I love those the the implications of quiet diversity is both the diversity we don't see and and keeping ourselves calm and and, and not loud. Um, I'd love if if any of you have a, um, some experiences or examples about how um, you have helped create an environment of um, of that acceptance of that psychological safety at the board level, and helped it um, kind of move down into the organization and really transform the cultures of the organizations to be a more accepting and open um, environment. We had some challenges uh, on our board relative to just um, people moving off the board. And those discussions were very challenging in terms of just, you know, you're talking about other people, some people, it, it, it was a really difficult conversation. I think creating these, you know, these safety pools, you know, for me, my, the experience I brought from my work into that was in technology, things always go wrong. And so if you're, yes, you should try to make things not go wrong, but more importantly, you should know what to do when things go wrong and how to fix it and move forward and prevent it from happening in the future. I think creating that safe zone for people to be able to speak up and say, I made a mistake, I, I made an error, is the same skill set you need in the boardroom, which is to really, if you're going to get people contributing to the pool of safety, they have to feel that what they say is going to be heard, but respected. And I think listening for what they're saying, I think when things get heated, personally, I think it's important to realign the group and just say, hey, we're all here for the same reason. We all share the same goal. This is the goal. And try to tamp down a little bit um, 
the emotion because I think emotion can derail a good safety environment, right? Violence, people fleeing from safety. So, and I don't mean physical violence, but I'm talking about when your ideas, when you're afraid to bring up your ideas because you fear something bad will happen. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think if I could add to that, I think that one thing that I've tried to do in the past is really try to, to take the idea or, or issue for a test drive with my CEO first and or the chairman and really kind of get support and feedback. Uh, uh, and so when I go into that board meeting, I know that I have at least one co-pilot on the issue to really kind of drive the point home. And then number two is I think it's important to um, uh, really kind of present the issue as a question. Right. I think it's a board member, your job to provide advice and perspective. And it's not to tell the CEO or the team what to do, but to kind of provide a, a different perspective. And so I like to kind of present issues in the form of a question to make sure we can have a discussion about it as opposed to it being some kind of a statement or a kind of dictatorship. I'm going to circle back to uh, Karen, was, you were talking about relying on convention and some of the, the, the issues that happen when we get into groupthink, which, which can happen regardless of, of you know, how diverse a uh, group may be. You, saw, you kind of begin to coalesce into a pattern. I'm wondering if, if any of you have had experiences where you have kind of stepped back from that moment where you've said, you know, we're all here in this place of, of you know, we kind of all got on the bandwagon and we're, we're moving along. Is it time to, for someone to jump off and kind of look at this from a different perspective? And whether you've had that experience, what that's like and, and what that resulted in. I think, uh, well, I think my experience sometimes has been uh, there's, there was a point where uh, it seemed like everyone was uh, expressing lots of diversity of opinion and there was a lot of, you know, what you would call brainstorming going on. Um, and taking a step back, it looked like, one, uh, some ideas were acceptable, the wacky, crazy stuff was okay, but the uh, more conventional things were not. And, and so you were having this uh, ironic, um, let's all be nonconformist together <laughs> to the exclusion of, of uh, and, and taking a step back, being able to facilitate and saying, hey, I know we're in brainstorm mode, but in order to make this work, we need the brainstorm and we need the, the plan. We, we need the, ex the ability to execute. When are we doing, when are we doing each? And it's fine if we're going to keep this in brainstorm mode, but at some point, this this question's going to shift if, if we're going to move forward. Um, and at least acknowledging to be able to bucket when things were happening, so people didn't get um, feel excluded or get offended or feel again like their their ideas weren't um, mattering. Just having the forum in the right place and time for the different modes is is really important. And do you find uh, this to anyone here the that there is someone on the on if you imagine some of the boards that you have served on and, and are serving on, are there people on those boards who play that role specifically? That you know this is the person who is going to be the the one to call us out to bring us back to um, bring somebody into the conversation who has been been holding out. Um, or is that become really a role for everyone? And I guess the what I'm kind of uh, pushing to here is, do we need to develop a skill set around, um, frankly, participating in and um, engaging a, a diverse perspective, a, um, the, the board, creating that environment for psych psychological safety? Is it something we want to call out and find you know, that somebody owns on the board, maybe somebody beyond the, the chair of the board, or is it a skill that we need to, do, every board member needs to develop and be very conscious of in a meeting when it's so easy to just kind of get into the flow of the business that you forget to kind of look at it from a, a higher level? I, I think every, every uh, go ahead, Miller. No, please, Arthur, go ahead. I, I think every board has a personality and a dynamic, right? Um, and I think it's important to, to take that personality and dynamic and shape it intentionally. 
And I think it's the chairman's ultimate job to do that. But I think it's also every other board member's job to really kind of shape that that personality and to make it the best possible. Because because you tend to have um, individuals on the board that may be a former CEO or a longtime founder that have a certain personality, more willing to kind of voice their opinions. You may have a new board member that may be uneasy with asking a question initially. So I think it's important to understand what is the board dynamic that we want? What is the board dynamic that we have today? And how do we go from there to, from here to there? Uh, and I think it's ultimately going to be the chairman and the CEO's job to really kind of cultivate that. But it's also going to be incumbent upon every single board member to really kind of mature and to cultivate that personality of that board to make it more effective. I would agree with that. And I would say um, it's the most effective boards that I've been on uh, are have been where everyone takes that responsibility. And when they see somebody not participating uh, or kind of, they, they, hey, we haven't heard from so-and-so, what do you think? And, and kind of bringing that, those voices in. And I would also say that extends not just, you know, we've been talking a lot about, or maybe assuming that we're talking about meetings and groups when we're all together. But as you know, so much of, of board dynamics take place outside of, of those meetings and uh, having that uh, dynamic where people and those relationships outside of the room uh, where people can ask questions, uh, express their views to one another before you get into that room, um, r really, really also helps facilitate effectively. One of the things that's really impressed me is that there are some people on the board that have a lot of expertise in the area we're discussing, but I've noticed that it's certainly one or two of the people will hold back and be the last person to speak on the topic which I actually think is really helpful because there's a tendency to say, oh, whatever he says, well, that that's going to carry the day. And so I think that's another strategy that boards can use to not necessarily hear from the expert in that area on the board, but wait to get maybe get that input last. I was going to, I know you've been trying to get in here, so I want to make sure you get, you have a chance. I was following following on what all all the panelists said. I, I think it's important to try to create that environment where people feel comfortable either in the meeting or outside of the meeting, as Karen commented, to get some questions raised. And sometimes it's the chairman, as Arthur said, or the lead independent director becomes someone who reaches out to other board members to see if there's some things on their mind that they did not want to raise in the meeting. Um, hopefully you get to the point where everybody feels comfortable uh, commenting and that's where the choice of words at times becomes important you don't need a bomb thrower so to speak in the board meeting you just need people to ask questions and the comment that that comes to mind here i made a note here about falling into a pattern i think sometimes as a new board member um, when you get this you know 200 page read ahead package and you're going through all of this and you're getting ready to go into the first board meeting uh, you might ask you know how uh, how long ago did we uh, evaluate the, the flow of our board meeting. You're not being critical. You're just kind of asking your questions as a, as a new board member. And sometimes you'll find, well, we haven't, we haven't changed it for four years. Well, maybe there's time. This is the time to take a look at how we're running our board meetings to incorporate some of the things that are important around quiet diversity, if you will. Uh, making sure that as, as employees are included in some of the board interactions, um, board dinners are typically where you see some of the senior executives from the company. Where, where are they finding these people who come to the board dinner? Where, and who's making the decisions on who comes to the board dinner? Uh, if you're supposed to be looking at candidates on the succession plan, you need to start asking some questions about that uh, so that people who uh, sort of reflect the quiet diversity that you hope to see in the company are being included in these sort of inf so-called informal gatherings, which are not informal at all. Those are really important from a career development perspective for those executives and senior team members who are brought to those meetings or invited to those meetings. So I, I just think that board members need to be sort of out there in terms of asking questions, but using the right sort of approach so as not to offend their fellow board members. Remember that most board members are strong leaders in their own right. Uh, and as a strong leader, they, they also most likely have good follower skills, as I call it. They know how to be on the team. And so you want to make sure that everybody feels as though they're part of that team. And, and that goes back to a comment that I, I think Mercedes made about, or maybe Arthur and Mercedes both, about disagreements on board decisions. I think it's really uh, telling when you have some disagreements about a decision, you make the decision, and then, you know, a quarter later or two quarters later, something didn't work. What do people say? Do they say, I told you so? Or do they say, you know, we probably should have thought about that a little bit more. I mean, you want board members who understand that once a decision is made, it's the board's decision. It's not half of the board's decision. It is the board's decision, and they need to stand behind it. Right. 
We, uh, Miller, I think you tee up uh, the next question really well with those comments, um, because we've been talking so far about really the interaction among board members and the participation as a board member among uh, among the board. The question really is, is then how does the board begin to influence the organizational culture? How do we? How does the board drive the this, um, the value of diversity? Um, I think objective and, and quiet into the organization in a way that it really can be transformative to the organizations you're helping to lead. Maybe this is a simple answer. Oh, oh go ahead. Now, I was going to say one of the things that uh, that we we did one time is that, is that uh, I, I noticed that um, in the board deck the diversity section was always last because that was like the last section. If we run out of time, we wouldn't cover it. And so the comment was made, hey, let's put this further up in the deck because it's important to us. And then we also looked at the company's, you know, corporate goals. Uh, diversity was a very, very small part of it. Even though they talked a lot about diversity being important to the company, it wasn't reflected in some of the in some of the board goals and putting in some of the operating mechanisms in, in the business. And so based on that that board discussion, we started to kind of have diversity be part of the, the operating rhythm of the business a lot more. And we also spent more airtime at the board talking about diversity. And that tended to trickle down into the organization to really kind of put diversity more at the forefront as opposed to just talking about it. It became part of the operating rhythm or more of the operating rhythm of the of the business based on that based on that initial board discussion. Can can any of you kind of take us into some of those conversations? Because I think that often the conversation is diversity, yes, we ought to have it. Um, but, uh, I'd love if you could, if anyone has an example of uh, the way in which by being intentional, seeking out diverse experiences has actually been, had an impact on a, on a specific business decision or product outcome, service outcome. Um, can you, can you think of, of, of any examples from your experience where it's not just to say this is a nice to have, but this is really an essential to have dynamic in a business, um, how do, you know, I would love that we might in our lifetimes come to a place where we don't have to have DEI in the, in the binder because, and we don't have to have the discussion because it just is, um, we're way f away from that. But I think identifying these really very specific places where it has made a difference, where it has brought some, you know, it's pre prevented a, a, a crisis or or solved one. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any examples from your experiences. Well, Chris, um, I do have an example and, and it was sort of an interesting conversation because it, it, and I keep going back to the quiet diversity piece because that was, we didn't use, we did not use those words, but that's essentially where we sort of ended up because we were talking about the research out there that, that seems to indicate that diverse management teams tend to outperform their competitors. And the question is, why is that? And how do we how do we really identify how they're outperforming competitors? And the conclusion we came to this is in a board uh, strategy session. The conclusion that we came to, and I'm looking at a note here because I made a note to myself, is that uh, it's hard to it's hard to put specifics on it, but we know that things were better because there was diversity in the room when decisions were being made. And uh, it isn't that women or people of color come into the room or folks with other sorts of diversity, people of all abilities who are in the, in the decision-making process. Um, it isn't that they're doing things specifically. It's that we're there. And because we're there, the conversation flows differently. There's a different sense of, um, of what is appropriate to discuss, uh, but it isn't stated openly. And as a result, we get a better outcome. So we we came to the conclusion this board in this board session. Look at my notes here that it's it's essential to have and nice to have at the same time, but it's hard to really put your finger on it. Um, but the data seems to say it's important. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm wondering. So so yes, the data absolutely says uh, in, that the companies with diverse. Um, that have embraced diversity, um, have diverse leadership teams, way outperform that very, and, and by the way, whether it's uh, all women or all men or all people of color or all, you know, any, you know, anything that is, is homogenous is less well-performing 
um, is essentially what, what the data repeatedly tells us. Um, I, I want to go back to something that we were kind of touching on a little bit earlier in the conversation, which is then how do we get to that? How do we get to quiet diversity? Because I can look at my a board of directors and I can say, well, there are just too too many few there's too few women on this board. There are not enough people of co color. It's harder to inventory, if you will, other kinds of diversity, right? So to say, you know, raise your hand if you grew up poor. I mean, that's you're not going to have that conversation. And yet, that perspective is super important, right? So, you know, how do we identify that you went to a public university versus a private university versus an elite university versus community college? All of those very many vectors of diversity, uh, which you know, maybe it's let's get in the car and listen to the rap music too loud and allow a conversation to flow from that. But it, you know, it, being in, if you want to be intentional about creating that d diverse organization, you kind of have to have these these conversations that are often kind of uh, let's say you know, HR would tell you not to have that discussion. Right? So how how are you finding and how are you directing? Uh, your organizations to um, to start kind of mining for that um, those those diverse perspectives. I think it starts with what's what's going to be important for the organization to achieve its strategy. For example, if you are an organization and you have a big mission to expand in Latin America, for example, um, it's going to be important to have some 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 Latin American perspectives on on how it's going to work. So I think it's important to understand. Let's link it back to the business strategy and what diverse perspective will help us best achieve our strategy. So I think it's basically because there's, there's like an almost infinite number of diverse dimensions that you can kind of you can kind of you can speak to, and so it's hard to kind of get every single one. But I think I'd link it to what's going to help impact the business strategy the most uh, from a diverse diverse perspective uh, standpoint, and kind of really kind of hone in on those things. I think that's the one one way to tackle because you can't boil the ocean. Mm -hmm. Karen, I'm wondering maybe because of your, your investor background, whether you're seeing that those kinds of discussions where it's where it, it, often too in startups, these startup founding teams become very co coalesce. Um, are you finding that, that you're kind of trying to break some of those, you know, chip some of that open in a way that allows those founding teams to, to broaden their perspectives? I think there's a lot more discussion around culture now than there used to be. Uh, and culture uh, was, I guess, kind of a euphemism for uh, keeping to your own tribe and only hiring people you knew. Uh, and I think startups that, uh, especially early stage, they're you know, on a budget. So expanding that network and, and spending money and time that's trying to move quickly is also is, is difficult. But I think at, um, with the discussion and emphasis now on culture, starting from the beginning to be very intentional about the culture they're trying to build, the again, the qualities and skills that they're seeking. And um, we talk about in the same way they're gonna you know, operationalize the idea, uh, operationalizing culture. So it's not just, um, you know, it's not just to say, we believe in direct communication. Well, are you actually doing that? How, what, what's the next level down of implementing that? And what happens when someone is direct communicator or not direct communicator for good or bad, you know, what are the consequences? What are the, what is the subtext around that? So um, they can really be again, self-aware around what they're building and who they're bringing in to create and solidify that culture um, the way they want it from the beginning, because it gets, it, it gets hardened so quickly, way more quickly than people realize it's baked in almost right from the beginning. You know, following my parents' comment, a, a phrase that I use sometimes in this sort of discussion is that an organization is the ever widening shadow of the person at the top. And so it doesn't surprise me if a senior executive is engaging in bad behavior, that one will find that other executives in the company are engaging in similar bad behavior. So I think it's important in the boardroom to, to get a sense of where the senior executives in the company are, uh, see themselves going from a culture perspective. As Karen said, it's very important. And influencing how they look at the culture of the business, I believe, will influence the culture as it flows down through the company. Yeah, as an entrepreneur, uh, a very culture-forward organization that, that I work with that 
talks about hiring um, not for culture fit, but for culture add. Is this somebody who can come in and add to our um, organization in a way that we are better for it? Um, aligned for sure with the values and the mission of the organization, but bringing something new to our organization, some new to, to affect and add and embellish and make our culture even richer. So I'm trying to watch time and getting deeply involved in this conversation. I realize I need to invite our listeners to add their questions. Um, and so please, if you uh, are, are sitting and thinking, I wish they were talking about this thing or I want to know about something else, um, drop your questions in the chat and we'll get them, uh, try to get them in front of our panelists. And there was one that came in here, um, Miller, for you, really, you were talking about um, uh, the, the um, board nomination process, the, the, the um, uh, uh, I guess the question here is, is that as part of, is that part of the, this one is, um, is it part of the governance structure and how do the board members see the process of bringing in these new the, and more diverse, quiet, diverse uh, board members into the, into the, and onto the board? Uh, good question. Uh, I'll answer the question from both perspectives. If, if you're sitting on a board and you're not part of the nomination and governance committee, you need to be asking, how do you intend to, to, to recruit the next board member? And, and you know, in a, in a polite way, that should, nobody should be surprised if the whole board wants to know how is the non-gov committee going to approach the fact that one of the senior board members is retiring and you need to replace that person. So that's how you start asking the questions before that. If you're part of the non-gov committee, then you go back to kind of, to kind of the things that I talked about. You, if you're going to use a search firm or you're going to interview a few of the firms, uh, it's very telling from my experience to see what team shows up to talk about what they're going to do for you in terms of their their uh, possible work as a, as a search firm, and then you need to start driving that process in a in a good way, you know, not in a in a you know sort of disruptive way, but just in a in a straightforward way. Remember, you're the client as the non gov committee, and the search firm is working for you. So I think you have to ask the questions both as a member of the non gov committee or as a member of the board asking about what is that process going to look like? How often are you going to bring candidates to the board? Uh, because the non-gov committee does not make the final decision. Typically, it has to be a decision of the board. So how often are we going to see the candidate pool and so that we can comment on how your progress is, uh, is moving along? Uh, hopefully that helps the, the person who asked that question. And I think, you know, Miller, I think that, you know, in addition, like we always think about when we have um, a resignation or retirement on the board, we always think in terms of, what is the subject matter expertise that we need? Going back to what Arthur said in terms of being strategic about it, the way we could make a small change to move ourselves in this direction is to also think about what is that culture additive or what is that missing perspective that we'd also like to get on the board so that we're not only getting a domain expert, we're also getting that difference of perspective. And I think if we start talking about diversity a little bit more about being a difference of perspective and a little less about the things you sort of can see, then I think we start to open the door for opportunity. I really believe that one of the challenges with the whole DEI uh, space or initiatives is that they're, they try to be too lofty. And I think you need small changes um, to basically move yourself along the continuum. Mercedes, no, that's, that's such a great I, point because... Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. I was following behind Mercedes' yeah. comment. Most boards have a skills matrix, you know, that shows yeah. all the different things. And adding adding something around diversity or whatever you want to call it to that skills matrix is, is a nice first step. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> that's right. Great, great minds. Hey, well, here's a question, Mercedes, specifically for you. Um, but I think it might actually prove to be a... a an example, but particularly for organizations that are trying to think, how do we go from, from this place where we're, we're pretty um, homogenous to, to an organization that, that is more uh, embracing diversity? And the question really is around golf. Um, you know, you're part of that community. Golf has struggled to become a more diverse, um, uh, both for their players and their customers, the, the fans. Um, how do you think that, that um, you can use the kind of techniques, things we've been talking about in, in this industry that you're very deeply involved in to really transform it. It's a great question. First, I'll tell you that there's some really good news in terms of California. It's the state that's added the most golfers over the past um, two years. Certainly we saw with COVID 
there was a big uptick in people going out and playing golf because it was one of those safe sports um, things. We just recently here at Pebble held our first U.S. Women's Open. So I'll give everybody a moment to have some time to think about that, meaning that company has you know, been around since 1919, and we just hosted the first U.S. Women's Open event. And it was extraordinary. It was amazing to see the young women and to see the women come. And if you have a chance to look at some of the profiles, we had mothers-to-be, we had women on their um, honeymoons, we had teenagers. So it was really great. One of the things that we did as a company is we did support the largest fundraising effort that Girls Golf has seen, a $1.5 million award. Um, we make our courses, um, our hay, which is a short course, available to juniors and others to get them involved. I think one of the issues with golf is the time it takes to play. Um, but Chris, I also think you've brought up a great question in that traditionally golf has been where deals are made. And young women and men and everybody, they need to learn how to pick up the game and at least get to the point where you can play a scramble, right? You don't have to be amazing. You don't have to go on the tour. Um, so I really think, you know, all of these programs that are out there can help. But I also, I also believe in self-empowerment. Like, if you're interested, there's drive, putt, chip, you know, there are free events all over that people can learn. There's community colleges people can go to. So in today's world, the financial hurdle should not be there. And I would encourage everybody, organizations like First Tee, there's a lot of great organizations doing a lot to help people kind of come up in that space. I didn't expect the conversation to go to. Golf is an essential business tool, but uh, there you are. <laughs> Well, so I know we're, we're, there may be a few more questions here. There's one, I think it's the big question. It's a very hard question. And maybe it's the one we'll, we'll um, uh, kind of bring this, this discussion to hopefully some, some solid conclusion here. And there is, how do we measure diversity and inclusion? How do we know we're doing it right uh, or that we're doing it at all? Um, and uh, um, again, not just the, I, I was called the tick list diversity, right? Do we have that balance, the gender balance? Do we have diversity of, uh, you know, uh, around race, race and ethnicity, uh, you know, the, the diversity you can see, but how are we, so how do we measure it? Um, and how do we measure it at a deeper level where we really understand that, that people are bringing in um, skills and perspectives that um, maybe are unusual combinations, but that make our organizations better? Um, so um, maybe, Arthur, I'm going to toss that question to you first. How are you seeing uh, measurability um, paying off? That definitely is a hard question. I think, I mean, the basic measurements of measuring the diverse force, not only you know, the current you know, butts and seats, but also the engagement. You want to make sure that the employee engagement is, is at the same level or above the, the level of the majority but I think as far as making the right decisions, I mean, it's it's hard to kind of measure the counterfactual, the decisions you didn't make and et cetera. So I think it's it's a matter of um, are we hitting the goals that we set as an organization is probably one of the best measures. And if we're not hitting the goals, why aren't we? Is it because of a different perspective? Is it because of something else? So I think that um, having the right diverse workforce, making sure the engagement level is at or better than the majority, and then the ability to hit hit the goals you set in place is probably, to me, uh, the measures that, uh, that speak to, do you have the right kind of diverse set of perspective at the board and uh, in the workforce? And I think referrals into the company is another way to measure. Like if you're the, if you have a diverse perspective and you come to the organization and you feel heard and you feel comfortable, then if you're willing to bring others, you know, with now with similar backgrounds, but really seeing a growth in that percentage of, of people, that's more at the company level and perhaps less less at the board level. But I think that, I think one of the signs, this is a negative thing, I think one of the signs that you don't have enough diversity of thought around the table is that the conversations are not robust. That, you know, I think Arthur said it, that there was no disagreement. Everybody's like, okay, let's just do this. 
So I think that would be a, a red flag if I were the CEO or the chair of a board that, you know, the meetings have become very perfunctory. I think another approach that has proven to be uh, interesting to observe is employee surveys and how people are reaction, reacting rather to questions around their perception of diversity in the organization. As an example, um, one of the companies that I'm involved with has lots of employee research, resource groups, ERGs, you know, for all kinds of different, you know, veterans and people of color and, you know, women and, and all these different groups, there's several, a whole bunch of them. And I found myself from time to time interacting with some of these groups when they have their annual meetings. And I asked a question once of a couple of folks, how would you know, we're, and the question was, how would you know we're making progress? How, how would you come to the conclusion that we're making progress as a company? And their answer was really straightforward. They said, well, Miller, we'd start to see people who look like us in management at various levels, not, you know, the CEO or something, but just, and it, just sort of around the management team across the company, we would start to see people who look like us. I thought, oh, interesting. And so the employee survey asked a question about that. And they came back with a similar response. How do you think we're doing in terms of diversity? How would you gauge that we're making progress in terms of diversity? And even on the employee survey, which was uh, you know, confidential, of course, employees said, we'd start to see more diversity in management. We'd start to see people who look like us running major components of the business. And uh, we thought that was kind of interesting at the board level to see how they were reacting to that question. So I don't know how to measure it. But the employee said, we'll know it when we see it. Mm -hmm. that, well, that is, I think it really, it, it, maybe the, the know it when you see it is a, a perfect measure, right? Because you can look at, look around the table, you can look at, into the C-suite and you can see what have we got here and how do we change that complexion, maybe literally and figuratively to begin to look more like the, the, if you will, the rank and file of the workforce. And, and have you, in any of your, your boards collectively, looked at, um, you know, been, rather than sort of discussing the, the DEI part in the back of the binder on your board meetings, said, let's just really take a look right now. What are we missing? What, and how do we break that up? And I know that's challenging because that means moving personnel around most likely, but have you, have you, uh, I'd be interested to know if, if any of you have thought about um, the role of the board in in actually kind of putting your arms around th that problem and look looking at the the profile of the, the the leadership team and saying we've got to change this and we've got to change it quickly. We we have looked at um, because of the logistics company, right? We have a workforce that. Um, you know, traditionally isn't moving into management and leadership. And so we have asked the question, you know, can we start to see more information about even at the lowest levels, how are people moving into management? A lot of times people don't want to move into management because they're going to lose over time and things like that. And it's actually going to have financial impact on them. Um, so that we've asked that question in terms of beginning the conversation, but I would say it's pretty nascent um in in the discussions we're having because it, it we're also ha then management really has to go back and figure out what are the tools and training and things that need to be provided for this group to be able to move up because some of those issues might have to do with child care they might have to do with transportation there could be a lot of reasons why people aren't seeking the manager level roles um, that are more, I don't want to say systemic, but they're just, they're different causes and it's not an easy problem to solve. We've had those discussions as well. And I think some of which were intentional uh, and some which were kind of accidental because somebody was happened to be talking in a sidebar about uh, pre-COVID, the ability to shift hours or work from home and would that qualify them or disqualify someone on their team from a management role. And uh, we're like, wait, hey, if they're doing the job, what, what, wait, how are you thinking about that? Let's, let's, that's interesting. Let's have a conversation there. And it, it sparked a, a really productive discussion around uh, attracting and retaining the best people uh, and in, in what, again, conditions uh, for, for management. Uh, 
And then, you know, on the more formal side, looking at it from, uh, a, again, a perspective around, uh, from a quiet diversity perspective, you know, how do we like people who make decisions and what uh, type of person is going to be most effective here? And having the conversation around a uh, majority of introverts versus extroverts um, and having a balance of, of introverted and extroverted folks in the organization and those who can get along with one another in order to pull the best uh, decisions out of the group so everyone's just not sitting thinking that uh, they, they can express themselves. Uh, so uh, these discussions happen a lot. I think it's important to continue to push on them and in all perspectives, quiet and, uh, and, and otherwise. So another question here that, that just popped up saying from uh, to kind of layer in an international perspective, are you seeing that the kinds of conversations that are happening um, in, in other parts of the world and, and here in the United States might be um, having, having a, are there real variances that we should pay attention to, I guess? And, um, and what, if there are those differences, what can we learn from them? Well, we see it a lot I, I, in uh, companies that are looking to expand. Uh, so you have mm -hmm. a, a company that was uh, headquartered in the U.S. and looking to expand abroad and then vice versa. And the first folks on the team, sometimes there's a lot of uh, adjustment and adaptation um, just in, in styles in that way and making sure that they feel heard and and. Uh, there's not uh, sort of orders beamed down, you know, and then it can really adapt to be successful uh, in that expanded market. So there's a lot of conversations around that as well. Um, I think, uh, again, depending on the area, you know, um, DEI will have a certain uh, familiarity or, or lack of, and then it's up to the company to really um, explain why, why that's important. Mercedes, I think was you who said in, in your sort of early remarks, uh, you talked about the diversity of being a first time board member. I think that you were saying that that, that brought some new perspective to, to a board. And for people who are on this call who are thinking, I want to, I want to get on a board. I'm not on a board yet. I want to know how to be, to bring these issues to boards. I, there is a, certainly there is, um, a movement, if that's the right word to, to create more diverse boards. Um, but often that's, you know, it, there is a, a universe of people who have served on boards who become the universe of people who serve on boards. You know, and, and bringing in these new, new voices, this new experience, this new um, skill sets, um, it's, it's a little tougher, right? So we have to be intentional about reaching into to places that, uh, you know, and, and bringing the first, first time board members in um, rather than you know, finding the, the handful of people who serve on 12 boards because they tick the box for diversity. Um, how, I, I don't know what the, exactly the question is here, but, but you know, we, we, wanna, we always wanna hire for experience, right? Because that's what informs the thinking and brings this, this expertise to the board. How do we shift, or have you seen ways in, that we can effectively shift from a bias um, for experience to a bias for um, perspective. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing. Yes. I think, um, you have to play it to a strength, right? You have to, well, first of all, you have to have a board that's open to doing it. And I think all boards as part of non-gov should be considering, would we consider a first time board member, right? That, that would be one of the, you know, um, qualities that we would, you know, talk about. I think like anything else, you know, if you've worked in one industry, I worked in high tech a long time when I, wanted to take this role in hospitality, I was the dark horse. I was the only one who didn't have hospitality industry experience, which means a lot after you've spent 25 years in one area, right? But the reality is that I use that to say, I will bring fresh eyes in. I will not be tied to what's happening in this industry and just assume that it's a no-go. I will bring the innovation and the creativity that I've spent you know, the last 25 years cultivating. From a perspective of the board, I do want to say that there are so many 
very well qualified people out there. Maybe they're keeping their heads down a bit too much. Maybe we haven't met them yet. But I would encourage everybody, whether you're an existing board member or not, give that person the opportunity. Cultivate your network to meet people. Ask people if they're interested in board service. Sometimes it's as simple as asking that question. I did um, a couple of years ago help found an organization called Athena Alliance. I work on how women lead. Um, a dear friend of mine, Merlene Santil, um, uh, founded Black Women on Boards. Um, I talk to young women who are very young to say you should think about board service. Not that they're going to do it next week, but just like you might talk to a child and say you're going to go to college, right? You need to kind of help them understand what it is and demystify it a bit so that people will feel comfortable with it. So I personally believe that any board that would not consider having at least one new board member that maybe hasn't served before, but has this accomplished resume and leadership and what they do, they're being short-sighted. You know, following behind Mercedes, I like to remind board members that all of us were first-time board members at one time. And, uh, and people seem to forget that. Sort of like the CEO search. Well, this person's never been a CEO before. Well, all CEOs were first-time CEOs at one point in time. So let's let's get by that, as Mercedes said, and talk about the skills that they're going to bring to the to the situation. Well, and it seems too, Miller, that this is one of those places where um, having a role on the nominating committee or or helping to to nudge the nominating committee to say, you know, if you're bringing in a, a search firm, one of the requirements of the candidate pool is that they're first timers or that, that you've got enough first timers there that you're not just depending on, um, you know, a board resume, but you're, you're really looking at somebody more deeply to, to qualify them uh, to, to be put forward as a candidate and really directing your, your search firm in that way. Um, Karen, there's a question here. Well, I think directed maybe to you, but also, based on your comments, we'll, we'll open it up to anyone here on the panel. But you talked about introverts and extroverts. And um, the question here is, well, then what role might behavior, behavioral analytics have in bringing behavioral diversity into an organization? Um, especially, it says uh, you've got you know, multiple candidates, but they, and they have very similar skill sets or experience sets how do you turn to some to other tools like behavioral analytics? And are you seeing that uh, as being effective on, on the boards that you're working on? I think we're starting to see that. Uh, I, I think as we're looking at ways to uh, expand pools and um, at the same time also automate a lot of processes, which have there's danger in that as well. I think if you, you look at the, the benefits and, and drawbacks, it, again, they are tools. They are not to be 100% relied on and automated. Um, the whole point is that people are people and there's a judgment that goes into that that should be taken into account. Uh, but you know, for many years, we saw companies that did have um, behavioral analytics or surveys uh, alongside assessments in the recruiting process. And I think, um, we're definitely seeing companies uh, adopt those uh, and, and go forward. Um, again, I think it's a lot in how they're used. Uh, it's only as good as uh, how they're going to be managed. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I think it will become a, a bit more frequent, uh, again, as, as we're expanding pools and we're not relying on reference checks uh, or who knew this person, which, which can be um, pretty biased and just generally unreliable. Uh, these are just other data points that are useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I do think to add to that, that it's, it's critical to be very clear with, with uh, candidates or even with your internal folks why you're asking for these assessments. That it's not to, to you know, ferret out the serial killer among us. It's about um, really understanding how to bring people together. Right? I think one of the, you know, not to... Uh, Maybe it is the shameless plug for, for GRI that's hosting this conversation today, but having recently really dived deep into it, it's not to say, well, we want more people that fit this profile or fit that profile. It's if you are in this profile, then I know how to, to communicate more effectively with you because I know I understand what you need to be successful. As leadership moves from 
kind of the command and control. I've got, I know everything and I'm going to just kind of micromanage at some level down an organization or maybe not micromanage, but certainly command to a more leadership style, I think, that is more collaborative and more coaching and more um, nurturing um, to, to, to get the best from your workforce is to, to really understand who they are right? and to understand how they are best motivated and to tap their intrinsic desire to, to be part of the organization and perform. And so these tools can be very helpful in that way. Um, and I need, and if they are framed that way, then they're as much a tool for the employee as they are for, for management. And I think that's a really critical piece in trying to deploy uh, behavioral analytics. It's really about making sure that the employee understands that this is really a tool for them to get what they need so that this work can be most meaningful, enjoyable, and productive for them as well. And I think with the understanding as well um, that these are snapshots, uh, these are this is one element, like, like everything else, of assessment um, at a certain moment in time uh, in, in context. Uh, and, and so everyone sort of taking that into account in in decision making and ongoing uh, management and interactions, I think is is really key as well. There's another question here, um, and maybe it's it's coming back around and double clicking on something we touched on just very briefly earlier in the conversation. Um, and I'm going to kind of reframe it, but there were a lot of uh, exclamation points in this, this, the way this question was asked. So cl clearly there's a lot of emotion behind this. If it's the CEO's responsibility ultimately to um, assess the culture of the business, to conduct and create and nurture the culture of the business and, and the people of the organization. And if there's an HR organization that is, that is helping to direct and, and, and drive that um, and you know, all of the messiness of, of actually engaging with human beings, because we are, in fact, kind of messy creatures. Um, what really is the board's role? Should the board be diving into those people issues um, deeply in a way that, um, uh, you know, might be affecting culture, maybe affecting um, the way that HR operations are being run? Yeah, I think it's 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 clear that it's not the board's job to run the company. It's the job. It's their job to oversee management. And I think that as this becomes an issue that's important to the company that rises to the board level, the board should get involved. But there's a fine line between the board overseeing management and the board getting getting too deep into running the company. And we have to be clear about that bright line. So I think as this issue pops up and it becomes a strategic issue for the company, uh, it's something that should be discussed at the board level for sure. But I think that we have to be careful not to cross that line and to jump into uh, into too much detail and start to, to help to run the company. So it's, it's a very important distinction. I think that's a good reminder. Right? And especially, I think, you know, as I look at the work that some of you who are also investors and clearly on boards of earlier stage companies um, creating that, I think, my experience in the startup universe tends to be the board members get you know start maybe more deeply in the weeds of an, when the organization is young and then pull back um, as the organization grows. Um, but finding that that space that is actually enabling management, not meddling with management, if you will. We're, we've got, I think, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes left. I want to make sure that, that folks who have questions are, are putting those in the chat so that we can, can speak specifically to the concerns and issues that, that you have. Um, but I wanted to, to take a minute to ask you each to think about the power that you personally have to affect change in an organization at the board level um, and at other boards, if you will, meaning, I, I'm, I'm, as we've been talking, we've been thinking back to uh, the time when, and I just as background, I worked uh, a lot of done a lot of work in in events and executive events. We bring speakers together, we bring panelists together to talk about important issues like this one. And there was a time, and in, in particularly in the tech industry, where they were. Um, and, and I would say most panels around things like uh, investing, where it was a, a display of, of middle-aged white guys um, who would be sharing their perspectives. And that was uh, 
pointed out that that's not a that's not giving us a real 360 on on the issues. So we need to have more women on panels. And then there would be, uh, you know, I'd get a call saying you need to be on this. Could you be on this panel? Or you might get that call because they can tick the box that we hit, can put women's faces on bigger list. And there was a number of, of women who were much in demand as speakers who said, you know what? No, I am not going to be the only woman on a panel in order to um, satisfy your, your tick box requirement that there be women on panels. I wonder, because all of you in, in different ways represent and would be like the ideal, excuse me for saying it this way, but the ideal, be like that would tick the box for us. If we can get get Arthur and Miller and Mercedes and Karen on our boards, we'll, we'll, we'll be diverse. What role do you play it, personally and professionally to say, you know what, that's not enough. I'm not going to be, um, that's, not, that's not enough to make this meaningful board service for me. Here's what I need you to do. Uh, if you want to recruit me, this is what you also need to do to, to transform your board. Have you found yourself um, in a position where you might be able to use your authority um, to make a bigger change and make a bigger stand for diversity? That's, that's an outstanding question because I, I had that same concern and I went to one of my mentors and he told me, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it because it doesn't matter how you got there. Your job now is to become the most outstanding executive or outstanding board member you can. And now that you have that platform, you can bring more people with you. So don't fret about how you got there, but use your platform to your advantage and show them that you have a great perspective. You can be a great board member. You can be a great executive and bring more people with you. And so he said, don't, don't worry about the, the how you got their piece. And so I, I took that to heart. And that's what I advise people when I talk to them, when they face the same issue or the same question, I say, don't worry about that. No matter how you got there, you're there and now use it to your advantage. So I, I wonder for people who might be in the audience who are kind of, um, looking at themselves and saying, well, I don't, I don't tick the boxes for diversity. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, not, uh, I don't, uh, you know, I'm sort of the, the thing that everyone's trying to mix, mix up, right? How, how does that person say, or, or tap into, look into him or herself and say, wait a minute, these are my diverse perspectives. I might have uh, be a, a white guy who, went to Harvard and grew up in Connecticut, and that feels like not um, ticking the diversity box, but maybe I did, I don't know, service in the Peace Corps. Maybe I did something else um, that helps to, to you know, like sort of channel, rethink who we are in terms of that diverse perspective. Do you have advice for those individuals? I mean, we're all... A, a resume of diversity, I guess. Is I mean, the, the... We're, we're all different. I mean, we all are individuals at the end of the day, and we all have our gifts and our talents. And I mean, I think you started to dive in there in terms of what are the experiences that have shaped you, that have had ideally some sort, of, it's usually something profound, right, if you're going to bring it to the table, but it can be any experience, right? And I think to help people if you're passionate about a particular board and you want to join a particular board or be in an industry, et cetera, I think it's just important to help people understand, well, why are you powered? What do you, why do you feel so strongly about this, right? What do you bring to the table? And I think everybody brings a different gift. Um, now, I think the flip side of that is that board service, it's not like going for a job. You know, you, you may or may not get the role. It takes a long time. And um, it's not a personal, like you weren't good enough for the job. A lot of it does have to do with what the board was looking for and whether or not they found some individuals that they felt would be better fit. So I think you shouldn't give up, but you should be clear on what your value proposition is to a board. And that should include something about your perspective and what you bring to the table that would be good for that board. So I wouldn't discourage anybody from it. 
I would agree with Mercedes completely. I think that diversity of thought is really important for a board member. And using the example that you gave, Chris, uh, if a resume talked about someone that had all those different attributes that you laid out, but also said that they had spent time in the Peace Corps or they spent time in some sort of really unusual and thought provoking endeavor early in their career, particularly, that's that's sort of signposts the fact that there's a diversity of thinking there and certainly an interview would be able to tease that out and confirm that that's the case and i would not encourage anyone to be discouraged about board service if people are interested in board service they should pursue it because there are, there are thousands of boards out there nonprofit, for-profit public companies private companies there are a lot of boards out there and they all need good people who want to com be committed to their mission and I guess that's, that's another way of saying this is that if, if that maybe quiet diversity needs to become be, needs to be spoken out loud, and and that often um, when we are you know, writing our resumes or con our CVs, we we kind of maybe don't want to say some of that quiet part out loud because we feel like that's not supposed to be talked about. And and I think what I'm hearing here is yes, not only not only say it out loud, but really shout it be don't be quiet this is the stuff that, that, that these experiences these perspectives that make you a, a unique and valuable candidate um, so i said yes what chris is saying now so thank you for that i appreciate the affirmations those are uh, very important to creating this environment of, of safety uh, let's. I, we don't have a, a lot of time left, so what I'd love to do is a, a round robin, take whatever you need to say. This, but to really, um, again, I'm, I'm making an assumption that people joined this this uh, webinar today because they they really are are thinking about board service, either the service that they're already in, right, and how to do that, um, bring that uh, these issues to their boards and and um, and help to, to make change there, but also many people on this call who are looking for their first board service. Um, maybe some, some advice to those folks who want to join boards, how they might go about that, how they might learn from your experiences, uh, uh, not, uh, your first time boards or creating boards. Um, what's, what are, what are some of the pathways to board service that you can, can advise our listeners to, to, uh, undertake. And Karen, I'll start with you. Okay. Uh, I think one thing I would say is that we've been talking about somewhat board service as as a, a monolith a little. And we've talked about nonprofit, for-profit, stage, uh, uh, private versus public. We've, we've touched on it, but I really think that uh, when you think about your interest in board service, double clicking on that, uh, going or even triple clicking, you know, go, going those levels deeper and really segment the market to figure out what appeals to you most, uh, where your attributes may be most valued, uh, taking what's unique about you and, and what you're passionate about and, and really then developing a, a target list that's reasonable and then, um, you know, going, going after that. But it's, you know, when people come to me and they say, I'm interested in working at a startup. Okay. That, you know, that means so many different things, you know, what industry, what stage, what, you know, uh, what role, you know, so uh, applying that same analogy to board service and really honing in on where you want to be and can be most effective will probably serve you well. Arthur, yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think to, to piggyback on, I think that it's really important to understand your why. Like, why do you want to be on a board? Not because it's, it's the latest fad, but really understand five, six levels deep why you want to be on a board. And as Karen said, once you figure that out, really kind of identify your value proposition on what value do you add to the board. And next, tell everybody you know that you want to be on a board. Because you will be surprised that within your network, and you grow a network, how opportunities come your way because there's no blueprint for finding a board that's not really posted on job boards anywhere, but tell everybody you know you want to be on boards. Expand your network to, to, to with current board members, prospective board members, and, uh, and you'll see where, where the magic starts to happen because it's, it's a journey that's, that's going gonna, gonna to be serendipitous, I think. Miller, you, uh, your thoughts on getting on uh, finding your path to board service? Yes, I think it's important to sort of 
be somewhat realistic about the process you're getting into. Most folks are not going to find themselves on a Fortune 100 board, public company board, as their first board. That, that's highly unlikely. But there are all these different things you can do along the way, starting with a condominium HOA board. I mean, you, you have to have the experience of being in a group that is making decisions based on input from their environment. And, uh, and I recall early on in my career, uh, in a mentoring program through the Chamber of Commerce here in Seattle, I met with a person who was running a big public company. And he looked at the resume that I gave him. I was a young lawyer at the time. He looked at the resume and he says, well, you're doing lots of different things. I was on a church vestry, you know, which is like the, the board of a church. And I was doing these different things. He said, those are all the things that are important to build your level of understanding about how boards operate and function. Uh, but he said, once you've done those things, think about what would be the next level of of, of exciting environment for you? What would you find that to be? And he talked about, you know, uh, arts organizations, and then he talked about bigger arts organizations. And the, I think the flavor of his conversation was that nonprofit boards tend to be the pathway to public company boards, either with startup companies, early stage, you know, private companies. Every, all of us here seem to be working somehow with private equity. And so we're, we find ourselves on boards of our portfolio companies. That's another pathway that we have. But if you're really aspiring to to a public company board uh, that uh, that is you know pretty visible, pretty you know high profile, you're going to have to be realistic. Another thing he encouraged me to do, which I did, was to register with various search firms. They all have an intake process where you put yourself into the mix, along frankly with hundreds of others and thousands of others, but you put yourself into their system so that your name is now floating around in their ecosystem as a person who's interested in boards. And some of those search firms will help you develop your resume because a board resume is typically different than, you know, than a Vita that we might have. Uh, and so they can help you with your resume and so forth. So going to some of these search firms and they're easy to find, just Google search, executive search firms, and you'll get a whole list of them. But going to those firms and working your way into their intake system or whatever they call it and getting your resume into their system is another uh, thing that I think is important. It may not bear fruit immediately, but it, it gets your name into that ecosystem. And Mercedes, you, you t mentioned uh, a bit ago a couple of organizations that you've been part of, of uh, building to bring more um, uh, women, I think you said, and, and people of color into boards. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think there are a lot of organizations that will help you build out the bio and help you get ready, mock interviews, all of that. I think... And, you know, everyone on the panel has hit on some of the, the things that I was thinking. The, the one I, the other thing I would add is if you're looking to join a public board, see who you know in your network who's already on a public board and take a coffee with them, take a meeting with them. It may not be your cup of tea. It may not be what you think it is. And so I think it's like anything else, you want to do your diligence um, to make sure that you're going after the right thing. And then I think the other thing that everybody has said, and I will just put a pin on it, is you have to take action. You can't sit back. No one's just going to magically find you and bring you there. You, this is work. And by the way, when you get on the board, it's a lot of work as well. So you need to be prepared for the commitment and you want to do a good job because that's how you'll you know, get your reputation for the future. So there, you know, I, I, I mentioned a few a uh, few groups. There's a lot of groups that are now trying to help. And I also do believe, I'll, I'll close by saying from my perspective, that board service can be extremely rewarding. It helps you put together all the things you've done in the past, and you start to realize that you really can provide mentorship and, and oversight for the management team that they really appreciate. So... You, you learn a lot along the way. Um, and so it can be very, very rewarding, but it is also a lot of work. Well, that's, I think, a really fine note. We're, we're really quite close to our, our time. And, and I just want to thank all of you for being part of this discussion because there's, I think we take a lot from it. Um, namely, I think that, that we need to say the quiet parts out loud and be okay to talk about some of our experiences that do uh, differentiate us and bring a new voice to, to conversations, either in management or at the board level. And the diversity, um, both uh, big loud diversity and quiet diversity, really need to be very intentional in an organization. 
and that as those who are forging paths, Arthur, I, I really appreciated what you said, get there and then bring others along, make, make the change um, uh, coming up be, uh, with the platform you now have. So thank you, um, each of you, uh, Karen, Arthur, Miller, Mercedes, you're fabulous panelists and it's a great discussion. I'm gonna turn this back over to you, Frederick. Um, Remarks. Yes, if I can, and <clears throat> if the technology is working back, sorry about uh, you know, the initial <laughs> stage. Uh, I want to thank you also a lot for you know, your input, your insights, um, uh, the amazing discussion, uh, loud diversity, quiet diversity. There is a lot more to dig into um, and to do uh, on boards and also uh, in the companies with executives. So there's, there's a lot. Uh, we started you know, this debate at GI uh having worked with a lot of executive teams and uh seeing that also in boards uh, there was a need of uh, uh, more elaborate discussions on diversity uh we as you know assess you know character and uh, styles and uh, in a way that's uh, you know different than what the market is doing and hopefully we can bring it also to the boards uh so it's just uh, an initial stage so to speak we're going to conduct a study on the diversity in boards uh, very soon and hope to bring more into that discussion. So, but um, all those insights are um, uh, precious for us, for you know, a lot uh, we're going to do from now. So thank you again. Thanks, Chris, for your amazing work as always um, at moderating. So um, uh, we're so um, uh, blessed to have you uh, here. And uh, thanks again to everyone and to the participants. I hope uh, they learned something from, uh, from this uh, debate and uh, Look forward to continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.